British Columbia is an elaborate coastal province adorned with the great wild. This rugged yet lush terrain is a place where the rivers meet the ocean and where the journey begins for millions of salmon returning home to spawn. The fortitude and resilience of the salmon has given it a long history here. The earliest salmon fossil ever found in BC is estimated to be about 50 million years old. Salmon sport fishing is one of the oldest and still most popular outdoor recreational activities British Columbia has to offer. But in order to understand this complex and colorful industry, we have to look at both the changes and the celebrations across generations of anglers. How it was then and how it is now. Let's go back about 130 years to a place that at the time was inaccessible to most, Campbell River. The year is 1896, and the world's largest salmon on record was just caught by Sir Richard Musgrave in Campbell River. Soon after, he published the story of the event in The Field, a prominent British sports magazine that still exists today. I hooked a real monster. I played him for an hour and three quarters. He turned out to be 70 pounds, which I believe is the biggest salmon ever killed on a rod and line and double gut. There was a swift current, and he must have taken me nearly three miles down the coast. The size of the salmon reported by Sir Musgrave offered a new perspective on the idea of man against fish and marked the beginning of an exciting time for salmon sport fishing in British Columbia. Campbell River is located on the east coast of Vancouver Island. Once inaccessible by anything other than boat, the area has developed into a city with a population of about 35,000. If you ask around the world, there is little chance most people will know where it is. But ask any serious angler, and there is little chance that they don't. Campbell River has been on international radar since the turn of the century and has attracted many high-profile guests like Bob Hope, Bing Crosby, and the King and Queen of Siam, each hopeful to return home from the salmon capital of the world with their own exciting Tai tale. Uh, my name is Jeremy Maynard. Uh, I live in Campbell River. Uh, I was fortunate enough to move here by accident in 1973. And because I always, uh, even as a little boy, loved to fish, I gravitated into it. Uh, and by 1974, I got even luckier and got hired as a rookie guide at Painter's Lodge. Initially, the Painter family arrives here in 1922. He's looking for a place to start uh, a boat business and fishing business. Somebody from here said, hey, Campbell River is a great spot, and uh, they get a lot of tide over there, and uh, and you could rent them all day there. So he moved over, came over and took one look at the spit, and, and got my mother to come over on the, they had to come up on the Union steamship. So they built quite a few boats that first year, and and found a lot of People stayed at the Willows Hotel, and I guess it was more of a hotel for loggers, and they, they'd do a party all night, and, and the fishermen wanted to get up at four in the morning to go fishing. So some of a group of them came to my dad and said, hey, you gotta have some accommodation here, just tents or something. So we made them up some tents, so he put them up and they had flies over the top, so they didn't leak or anything, and they were about 20 by 20. They were quite good accommodation, and the people just loved it. Campbell River has been well known as a destination for sport fishing for, you know, literally a hundred years now. Um, so even in the 1970s, there was a long tradition. Uh, I mean, I, in those days, I would occasionally fish with people that came to Campbell River before the Second World War. In fact, I fished uh, in the very early 80s with a gentleman who claimed to have come to Painter's Lodge when it opened in 1939 and got skunked. Yeah. 
slowly as you know steamship travel and so forth it became a little bit easier to get to to Campbell River more and more people came I mean just a, you know small number by today's standards of course then the First World War came along and then gradually uh, in the early 1920s as uh, as uh, some sense of normalcy uh, resumed um, and it, and it became pretty much the same group of largely men who met on Tai Spit every year in the tent camp there to fish for these uh, large uh, Chinook salmon. You know, like my uncle uh, said in the Depression, he got more $500 tips in, during that time than he ever did after. You know, $500 in the 30s was as much as the logger working all year. It all began in the summer of 1924 at the Willows Hotel, a small international group of fishermen that were all repeat visitors to the area during Taiyi season met to discuss starting a club comparable to the already famous tuna club of Catalina Island. The purpose of this club was to standardize salmon fishing for sport in BC. It was there that Campbell River's oldest organization, the Taiyi Club, was conceived. An internationally recognized club, it has been overseen with strict authority and the rules have stayed basically the same since the beginning. A set of bylaws, partially based on the bylaws of the Tuna Club of Catalina, was drafted and adopted. The rules for the Taiyi Club fishery have remained largely unchanged over time. You have to use an artificial lure with a single hook now, um, with line that breaks at there's a weight actually, it uh, weighs 26 pounds and the line that you use mustn't be able to lift the weight so most people use a 20 pound monofilament line in this fishery. The rod has to be a minimum of 6 feet and no longer than 9 feet um, and the key thing is uh, that you, you must be under uh, self-propelled means, you can't use an outboard engine uh, trolling. Now in the 21st century that's kind of a unique thing. Nootka Marine Adventures, with three resorts on Vancouver Island. The Drive-In Mucha Bay Resort and the all-inclusive Nootka Sound and Newton Cove Resorts. All locations are situated within easy reach of some of the most consistent fishing grounds found anywhere on the west coast of British Columbia. Offering wildlife and heritage tours, guided sports fishing and unrivaled five-star service. Nootka Marine Adventures, a wilderness experience for everyone. There are a few dull moments cruising this historic waterway. What a beautiful looking fish, eh? Yeah. Look at those teeth for you, eh? Oh, boy. Talking to the local people, I'd learned that there was this really old buffalo bull in a certain area. It didn't take us long before we located his tracks. One of the great joys of big game hunting is the unpredictable nature of the pursuit. Yeah. In a place like this, it's easy to hold out for something very special. Major League Fishing is back with the Lucas Oil Challenge Cup presented by BMW Trailer Hitches. Here we go. Let the Cubs begin. It's always a challenge every time because you don't know what to expect. There he is. Oh, I know how this game is played. Get in here. <laughs> you can never let your foot off the gas. The hunt for the Cubs begins now. General Tire Major League Fishing, Saturday at 3 Eastern on Sportsman.
The name Tai is limited to a Chinook salmon weighing over 30 pounds. A bronze button is awarded for a 30 to 40 pound fish, a silver button for 40 to 50 pounds, a gold button for 50 to 60 pounds, and a diamond button for a fish over 60 pounds. It was decided to award an annual championship button to the fisherman landing the largest salmon. This angler was also to be named Tai Man. Now, although at the time anglers were primarily men, there were years when the award went to a woman. In 1934, the well-known Mrs. Butler was named Tai Man. In 1941, the title went to Mrs. Randall and Mrs. Ballou in 1960. Many have tried to bend the rules or buy their way into the Tai Club over the years and none have succeeded. The lifetime membership into this exclusive club must be earned. The club proved how strict they were about the rules in 1964 when eight-year-old Patricia Hughes caught a 73.5 pound tie. For her record-setting catch, Patricia did get her photo in the newspaper. However, she was not admitted to the club as her father had to help her reel it in. The club provides a waymaster who keeps watch on the pool, enforces club rules, records catches, and guides the century-old traditions like granting the right to ring the club bell, one ring for every 10 pounds. Somebody came up with the bright idea of a ship's bell to ring when you caught a qualifying fish. And so they hunted around, and of course, they, you know, in Seattle, very maritime city, they found a nice ship's bell, and they got it engraved, um, and now it hangs on the stand. And the tradition now is uh, that um, when you catch a qualifying fish, you're allowed to ring it once for every 10 pounds. So three rings for a 30 pounder, four rings for a 40 pounder, and so forth. So now it's great because when somebody goes up the beach, as we say, and takes a fish in, and we're everyone out there fishing is, is listening for the bell to see if it, you know, actually gets rung. And so everyone, a yeah, big cheer goes up. When... <laughs> and as you can see, there's some pretty mean rapids over there. And if he hits them, we're in trouble. I have a feeling just by fighting them for the last two, three minutes that this is the fish that we've been after for the last two and a half days. It's heavy. Right now, this is a big fish. Come experience it for yourself with River Monster Adventures. We believe in monsters. It's time to hit the range. Engage. And some targets. Jim and John Scouting bring you the latest in competitive shooting sports and the firearms industry. It's a safe and fun environment for shooters of all skill levels. You gotta aim, you gotta reload, you gotta look at the sights. There's a lot going on. This is where the shooters come together and hope to win it all. You don't just shoot a match, you work a match. Today, the tradition lives on. Here we are 40 years later, still playing cowboy action chicken. It's just plain fun being a cowboy or cowgirl. <laughs> Shooting USA, Saturday at 10 a.m. on Sportsman Channel. We get veterans or first responders who haven't seen each other in years. They reconnect. 2008 was probably the last time we saw each other, and it was the worst call we ever experienced, and it caused PTSD for both of us. We're able to do this because of the generosity of the Alberta government giving us a mental health grant this year. Not only is it helping veterans, but the dollars that we spent go right into the Alberta economy. Veteran Hunters on Sportsman Channel. This is a boat uh, that is very similar to what the original handliners used in the early days before 1900 and quite a bit most of it was after the 1900s in the 1910s, 20s, and 30s. The fisherman would tie the, his hand line to his leg with a special knot, so when the fish pulled on it, the knot let go and the line would start to run out into the water. 
he'd drop his oars, and then he would hand pull the fish back in. This is a part of his gear. This is how he would wrap up his line. Otherwise, he would have line all over the boat and nothing but tangles. So as he brought it in, he would wrap it around this stick that's been carved out, piece of wood, so it would just end very quickly. And when he wanted to let it out, he could just flip it like that, and it's going boom, 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 letting it out. But I can remember as a, a young, young boy, my father loved to sport fish. And we didn't have rods or reels, so we just used a hand line, and he'd troll along with the, hold the hand line till he, till he caught a fish. And when I started in the, working in the sport fish industry, um, we fish rod and reel, but you know, the old good old Pete's reels from way back in the day. Although they are now considered classics, Pete's reels and Lucky Louie's are still a standby of anglers everywhere, much like the Gibbs Spoon. In 1907, the then 25-year-old Ontario-born Rufus Gibbs traveled west with his knowledge of metalworking and his apprenticeship certificate from the Canadian General Electric Company. In 1908, with only five cents in his bank account, he opened Gibbs Tool and Stamping Works. He began producing fishing tackle in 1915 and is recognized as the first Canadian company to commercially manufacture it. Through his knowledge, passion, combined with the advantage of owning a facility, Gibbs was able to experiment with color and design, always taking into consideration the feedback he got from his customers in order to fine-tune the lures for the best possible fishing experience. Gibbs spoons became known for their quality as well as their efficacy, and Rufus ensured this by putting some time aside each day to personally make lures. The Gibbs spoon was one of the most popular, and Mr. Gibbs had uh, uh, was what we may call a full Gibbs 8. He was producing that, and the guides up here were starting to file down one end. They started to file what they call the toe end, where the line is attached, down to make it skinnier, eh? Here was a chance for Mr. Gibbs now to produce another spoon that would be popular. As well as an accomplished businessman, Rufus Gibbs was an avid sportsman. In his lifetime, he earned 79 tie buttons between the Campbell River and Comox clubs. His top catch from each club were both 61 pounds. He also served as president of the Campbell River tie club from 1953 to 1957. Rufus was a strong believer in giving back and it is estimated that Gibbs Tool and Stamping Works gave away more than $400,000 over the years in contributions to the British Columbia sport fishing industry, as well as many other local community organizations. Now, although Vancouver Island had gained international popularity for its salmon sport fishing, at the same time, other areas of BC began boasting their own salmon angling opportunities. Horseshoe Bay is located on the edge of West Vancouver, a location that is known for its easy access to fishing grounds around Bowen Island and Howe Sound. Horseshoe Bay is also home to Sewell's Marina, which is now run by fourth generation Sewell's after Dan Sewell Sr. made a deal to lease it for a dollar down payment and a dollar per week for every week that followed. The Sewell name has always been synonymous with sport fishing in the area. In 1938, Dan Sewell Sr. played host to the first fishing derby of its kind in an effort to raise money to build a community center in Horseshoe Bay. In the early 1930s, my granddad built a lap strike boat to be a prize in a fishing derby, and there was a fee to enter the derby, and the money all went to buying the two-by-fours and the boards to build a community center in Horseshoe Bay. And the idea caught on, and was, it was an exciting idea. People were th thrilled. And the province newspaper took it on as a fishing derby, and the San Vancouver Sun took it over from the province, and the derby went for many, many years. On the day of the derby, thousands of boats would fill Howe Sound, all with anglers hoping for the biggest catch. Children would run and laugh on the dock, and the air was alive with excitement and anticipation. The prizes were said to be really good, but most would remember it as just a great day on the water with family and friends. It was an interesting time for sport fishing, as the technologies were changing. Boats were now being made with materials lighter than wood, which made not only manufacturing, but also transporting them far easier. Now more people were able to afford to buy boats and could transport it with their vehicle making it a much more family-oriented activity. Derby in the early years was predominantly in rental boats, but as we moved through the 50s and people had their own boats, it was magical. There would be people sleeping on their boats the night before. The beach was full of boats pulled up. 
It was a, a complete party atmosphere, family atmosphere. It, it, was, it was just the magical British Columbia at its best. The Vancouver Sun sponsored the event and was there every year to get a photo of the winner and one for the cover of the following issue. Vancouver Sun was definitely a community newspaper, had a lot of readership, and they ended up uh, using Chuck Hurston, who built the first fiberglass boats, I believe, in North America. And fiberglass, uh, his boats, were the first prize, second prize, and third prize. And so it was a pretty substantial prize for the fishing community, for the people that were interested. This made competition so fierce that some contestants began to try to cheat. In fact, in 1967, the winner was sentenced to six months in prison when it was found out he had purchased from the dock the 37-pound salmon he used to win the competition. At the height of its popularity, the Sun Derby was rivaled only by the PNE and remained a much-anticipated event by many British Columbians for 44 years. The moment of truth. It used to be more like the moment of guess. Back then, estimating distance was what you did. And the results were hit and miss. Then, 25 years ago, Bushnell changed all that with the invention of the first laser rangefinder for hunters. And to this day, pioneering every major advancement in the category. On our 25th season, we'd like to say thank you, America, and that our best shots together are yet to come. Am I, am I on? Am I live? Let's kick this one off. Love is in the air. <sighs> Let's see what we can make happen. He's like, what just happened? I don't know what just happened, but it happened. Yeah, and it happened awesome. It's an outdoor show like no other. Julie, we're looking for a moose, but also bears. Finally made it to a destination. Not the original destination. A destination. We're in the, currently in the middle of a uh, whiteout. Hopefully this will pass and we can kill a ghost. It's like the ultimate game of Mission Impossible. <laughs> Look at that. Are you excited for the trip? I was. I'm now here. Pursue the Hunt, Saturday at 10 p.m. on Sportsman. Descendants of the North, I wanted to honor the traditions of the past hunters and trappers, my father and his father, and that that they taught us. My only hope is that I can teach one thing to someone out there, toughen it out, stick and stay, and make it pay. This rod and rail combo is an old friend. It's not the most high tech, it's not the most expensive gear. I've had it for over 25 years. My son caught his first salmon on it. My daughter caught her first salmon on it. My wife caught her first salmon on it. These guys are like my friends. So we're using them today because part of the spirit of sport fishing is about tradition. It's about family. It's about us getting out together, sharing this beautiful environment and hopefully having some fun catching some fish. So, for all you hardcore fishermen out there, I do have the high-tech stuff. I'm not using it today because these are my old friends. This is what I use when I'm fishing with family. See, my name is Martin Pache. I am the chair of the Sport Fishing Advisory Board of British Columbia. I'm a director of business development for the uh, Sport Fishing Institute of BC, and I'm a commissioner on the Pacific Salmon Commission. Easy. Nice. Ten, so you were all on bait? Ten, ten, what depth were you know, fishing? I was on bait. I was on bait. You want some bait? Uh, I got one pack. How deep were you? I'll give you another one. 70 okay. feet. 70? 70 feet on the line. Yeah. Perfect. There you go. There's the fishing report. Hi, I'm Ryan Chamberlain, owner of Vancouver Island Lodge. My involvement in the BC sport fishing industry, uh, you know, involves running a fishing lodge here in a coastal community, Super British Columbia bringing people from around the world, but also within Canada, British Columbia, locals within our community, getting them out on the water and really enjoying what our Pacific Ocean has to offer in terms of salmon and halibut, rockfish, 
crabs, prawns, you name it. You know, a lot of people don't get to have that experience. I'm, you know, it's my life to, you know, expose that to them and give them those opportunities. And I think it's so important because people get to learn about the habitat, the environment, um, you know, all the different species of mammals and, and salmon. It's my first time Chinook fishing off the coast of Sook, BC. I'm very excited. I've heard all about the excitement of the catch, tips up, tight lines. I will see. I'm very excited. So as we're out here today, we're, we're fishing using, admittedly, some of the latest technology that's out there. We, we have high-speed electric downriggers. Um, we've got a GPS and sounder system on board. As I said earlier, not using exactly the most high-tech rods and reels because they're my friends. But, uh, you know, from when I was a boy going out fishing with my dad and certainly from my dad's time, the way that we fish has changed dramatically. It really has. As a little boy, I remember going out off of Bowen Island or off of Texada Island, and the first thing my dad and I would do was rake herring. And uh, a herring rake was a long piece of cedar with nails, the pointy end of the nails sticking out in it, in a big, long section like this. And we would find a school of, uh, of small herring on top, and I would sit in the bow, I love doing this, I would sit in the bow and you would rake through the herring and then shake them off into the back of the boat. And we would put those in a bucket and we would either use them just whole or if they were still kind of alive, we'd send them down alive and, and that's how we fished. There was no sounder, there was none of that kind of stuff, no VHF radio, I mean, just went out and you did it by instinct, you did it by sight. It's funny in that there is there was more abundance then, but um, I think that the the fact that we caught as many as we did indicates that a lot of the technology that we use now is more about sort of the fun of using the technology and the convenience and particularly downriggers with the ability to keep weight off of your line and to have precise control over your depth is really more about the fact that it makes fishing more efficient. I don't think it makes it more effective. You can really see, I mean these are big yeah. salmon right here, some more down here. You can see one actually coming up for bait in here and it tells you exactly where to put your gear because you can you can see where the fish are. So I'm always bringing my downriggers up and down and trying to get them into the zone where those fish are. Yeah, I mean, technology's changed things. Um, in my mind, has it all made it all better? Not really. Has it made us that much more effective? Not really, but are the toys fun to play with? Sure they are, right? And that's why there's a lot of technology, a lot of gear, a lot of lures that are attractive to fishermen, perhaps more so than they are to fish. The BC Outdoor Show, April 8th through 10th at Chilliwack Heritage Park. Get the best of the outdoors lifestyle with an epic mix of fishing, hunting, boating, ATVs, outdoor adventure, and more. With exciting events happening all weekend long. Fly tying competition, casting pond, archery lane, family zone, exhibitor halls, and presentations by hosts from Sportsman Channel Canada. Come be a part of the BC Outdoor Show, April 8th through the 10th, Chilliwack Heritage Park. Go online and get your tickets today. Scorpion is here for the all-season hunter. With a precise range dial shoot system, Scorpion Outdoors promises unparalleled performance for hunters of all experience levels. Visit our website to learn more and find a dealer near you. Fishing is more to me than just a sport. It's completely therapeutic. It allows me to focus my mind and reset my perspective. This is why we hunt, to see things that nobody ever gets to see, to go places that nobody gets to go unless you're a hunter. <laughs> this is where the big bulls are, so this is where we want to be. I mean middle of nowhere, the place you dream of hunting. That was close, man. 99% just looking and 1% chaos. That's hunting for you. Hey, man. <laughs> it's about the animals, it's about the nature, it's about the woods, it's about the lakes. It's a beautiful thing to be outside and learn new things, see new things. One of the most beautiful places that nobody ever gets to see, except for us.
This is where we belong. Enjoy the greatness of Canada and be proud of your hunting heritage. Sportsman Channel, the home of the Canadian sportsman. Major League Fishing is back with the Lucas Oil Challenge Cup presented by BMW Trailer Hitches. Here we go. The hunt for the cups begins now. General Tire Major League Fishing. British Columbia's sport fishery has a direct impact on the province on both a macro and micro socio-economic level. Angling tourism provides income for guides, lodges, and coastal communities. It employs thousands of people on both a full-time and seasonal basis and contributes millions of dollars to provincial and federal tax revenue. By some communities, it is being seen as a way of the future that a transition to tourism from commercial fishing, logging, or mining is more sustainable over the long term. The business of angling understands that this powerful economic engine is solely based on the sustainable access to fish, and it has become part of the culture to make that the primary focus. Both government and privately run hatcheries along BC's coast have helped improve and maintain salmon stocks and help monitor the condition of even the wild salmon population. I'm Intan Cardell. I'm a fish culturist here at Chilliwack River Hatchery. So the fish uh, production process here at the Chilliwack River Hatchery starts off down below in our fishway. Uh, before the fish get into the fishway, they actually come swim into our attraction channel uh, and all of the fish go above what we call our finger weir so that they stay within the hatchery facility. We then count every fish as they hop up the fishway to go into our raceways, which is our concrete holding channels. Uh, once we have the number of males and females for our brood stocks, we then spawn them and collect the eggs and the milt from the males and the females. And then once we fertilize them, those eggs that have been fertilized with the milt, they get brought up into the building where they get thoroughly washed and cleaned as well as disinfected to make sure that there's no uh, external disease or parasites that get in and really affect those eggs. Once they've been cleaned and disinfected, then they get put into what we call the Atkins cells. So in here we have the summer Chinook eggs. So these guys respond end of August, early September. So for some of the juvenile fish, we actually conduct um, some marking programs as well, just to mark them and make sure that it's identified that they came from the hatchery. So for example, for the Chinook salmon, they get adipose uh, they get their adipose fin clipped, and then they also, the Chinook also get a coated wire tag. So the most important commercial salmon on the coast is the sockeye, and you still hear that today. This is the pink salmon. It was a great salmon that used uh, to help start up a, st a stream back. This is called the chum salmon, and uh, sometimes called the dog salmon. Coho is your sport fishing troll and they were called silvers. And of course here was our Chinook, known as the spring salmon, and once over 30 pounds, is known as the Tai'i. Fishing is more to me than just a sport. It's completely therapeutic. It allows me to focus my mind and reset my perspective. So we have a big day of fishing, okay, girl? So we need to pack a lot of food. Going out in the water, especially when it's with dad or Kev, is knowing that the kids are gonna be able to see their dad in his true element. Oh, wow, look at this one, girl. You wanna come help me? Yeah. Okay, come on over. Good job. Isn't that cool? 
So this is a virgin sturgeon that we tag. We're at a point where we're trying to bring awareness globally to people on how to protect the species. Okay, Bo, should we release them? Yeah! Being on the water is a place where the world feels the most simple. And the fish become a bit of a bonus. More about the people that you're with outdoors. Oh. I've been looking forward to this particular hunt for a long time. We're doing something that I'm very passionate and proud of. We have fun now. For the ultimate long-range big game hunts, look to the Rifleman. Not about the score. It is about the trophy. And the trophy is in the eye of the deer holder. It doesn't get any better than this. Like, unbelievable. Yes. And this is a true Saskatchewan trophy. Something else we need to acknowledge as fishermen, and I don't care what type of fisherman you are, is that when we catch a fish, we put it at risk of harm or death. There is just no denying that fact, and it doesn't matter what type of fisherman you are. So part of this responsibility that I believe that we have uh, towards these magnificent fish that we choose to, to pursue either as a recreational activity, as food for our family, as a spiritual activity, um, or as an economic activity, um, is that we have a responsibility to ensure that if we're going to release a fish, that it has absolutely every chance provided to it to survive that encounter. Hey, if you've got to release a fish, you should take it upon yourself to do it properly because the whole point of releasing it is to enable it to survive. And this is something that as anglers, I think that more and more and more we're grasping to a very large extent but uh, there's more work that needs to be done. And, uh, and through the Sport Fishing Institute, we'll be working on that to, uh, to increase the levels of awareness, to increase the education, to build a, uh, a, a set of best practices and a best practices manual to enable the average everyday angler to understand why this is important and how they can do their part as part of their fishing experience to make sure that they're able to harvest the abundant stocks and those stocks that they have to let go or let go in a way that ensures their survival. So shaker is simply a small fish, and the fish we've had probably 10 to 15 centimeter range, right? So this is when it's critical that fishers know how to release these fish, because they're your next year's catch. So Josie, if you step back, I'll step in front of you. So this is a small Chinook salmon, one that we want to let go. And we've, we've got a single hook on here so that we don't ever have to take it out of the water we can just use the gaff and it swims away without ever having been removed from the water or handled or anything. If you do it correctly, they are incredibly resilient. They'll have a very high survival rate, probably 70 to 90%, depending on the hook wound. All right, so take real care to release these fish. So these are all fish that are under a pound now. A year from now, these coho will be your fish that are 12 to 15 pounds. So once they actually start growing and right through the winter, these fish have an incredible capacity to grow in that. So the, the next year's coho are the coho that you take care of this summer. Now, that's not true for Chinook salmon because Chinook salmon have what we call multiple ages at maturity. Essentially, all the mature coho that you catch, certainly from north central BC south, are only three years old. Very rarely, once you get to the more northern latitudes, you get four-year-old co uh, coho. But Chinook are different. Chinook will mature at ages three to seven. And particularly in the rivers Zinnick, where we have the world-famous Wannick Chinook, those are fish that can be 60 to 90 pounds. One of the most powerful regulations we have out there from a sport fishing perspective as it relates to Chinook is this idea that salmon um, grow longer as they grow older. And so this idea that an 80 centimeter slot limit, like we have now, and here's hoping we'll get a 79 centimeter Chinook, but uh, this 80 centimeter slot limit is all about protecting five-year-old Chinook. And it'll do a really good job at that, so long as people do a good job of releasing them. From the DNA of two of the world's foremost hunting optics, the ultimate hunting machine is born. The all-new Fusion X range-finding binocular. With an industry-first advantage, its new active sync display fluidly morphs from black to red for max visibility in all lighting conditions. Delivering hair-splitting one-yard accuracy out to one mile, 
all inside a bright, razor-sharp optical system, ready to make you a tag-filling machine by Bushnell. Nootka Marine Adventures, with three resorts on Vancouver Island. The Drive-In Mucha Bay Resort and the all-inclusive Nootka Sound and Newton Cove Resorts. All locations are situated within easy reach of some of the most consistent fishing grounds found anywhere on the west coast of British Columbia. Offering wildlife and heritage tours, guided sports fishing, and unrivaled five-star service. Nootka Marine Adventures, a wilderness experience for everyone. Take to the wilds of Canada with Amanda Lynn Mayhew. It has been an incredible ride and I've got to do some very amazing adventures with lots of friends all over this beautiful country that we have. And I'm addicted to it. And so I can't wait to share it with you. That Hunting Girl on Sportsman Channel. This is why we hunt. To see things that nobody ever gets to see, to go places that Nobody gets to go unless you're a hunter. <laughs> this is where the big bulls are, so this is where we want to be. I mean middle of nowhere, the place you dream of hunting. 99% just looking and 1% chaos. That's hunting for you. That was close, man. This is where we belong. From enjoy the greatness of Canada and be proud of your hunting heritage. Sportsman Channel, the home of the Canadian sportsman. There's only two runs left in North America that consistently produce big salmon. One's the Kitsum Kalem and up by Terrace. And they, the second one is the Wanak River at Rivers Inlet. So we feel it's really important that if we want to see these big salmon return, is that we catch and release them. Um, and we're all guided at Good Hope. So all our guides are trained in, in proper release of these salmon. Um, and we're also taking um, scale samples and measurements of, of these fish so that when we're doing our hatchery work on the river, we can scale sample those fish and we could tell if that fish had been caught and released from our scale samples that we send in earlier. We also do DNA on them. Um, and so we can parent DNA these future stocks, right? So it's really important that if we want to see this big return of big salmon come back that we need to keep those genetics alive. Those genetics won't reproduce in your freezer. The private boaters that come to Rivers Inlet now have started buying into our catch and release program, which is really important that all Canadians understand the importance of, of releasing these big fish and only taking what you need. I think it's really important that we embrace that as Canadians um, to help save our wild salmon. Without wild salmon, I'm, there's, I mean, I might as well move to Winnipeg or somewhere and live off a of wheat. Well, you know, to me, in terms of a favorite fishing experience, fishing to me has always been about family. Um, I got into fishing because my father got into fishing. My father got into fishing because my, my, grand, my maternal grandfather was into fishing, right? And so we're going back generations. And, and I have fishing rods on the wall that are almost 200 years old that I inherited from my dad and he inherited them from my grandfather. I have homemade lures of my grandfather's that are well over 100 years old. My great grandfather, sorry. My favorite fishing memory would be um, when my father, my son and myself went up to Langar Island. And my father was already uh, getting on enough that he was having a hard time getting in and out of the boat, having a hard time getting into his boots and that kind of stuff. And that's when I realized that my 12-year-old son was becoming a young man. Because without any indication, any asking or suggestion for me, he helped granddad throughout that entire trip. And karm, that kind of responsibility from him paid off in terms of fishing karma because there's a spot in, uh, at Langara called Gunia Point, which can get very, very congested and, and very busy. And uh, we're out there fishing together. 
and uh, my dad and my kid got into a double header. And um, I heard uh, one of the Langara Fishing Lodge boats get on the radio, and we've always had a great relationship with the folks at Langara Fishing Adventures. And um, they got on the uh, on the radio and said, "Hey, Marty and his dad and his kid have got a fish on. Give them some room." And it was the coolest thing in the world to watch the fleet separate as we're scrapping these two fish. Let us get out of the fleet. They were hard enough fighters that we went back into the fleet again. And it's like we were parting the waters as we went in. And then we landed them both, you know, a 12-year-old and his 78-year-old grandfather landing a fish together. Um, we basically, uh, I had to literally dump one fish out of the net and scoop the next one. And then to get this big hearty round of applause. I mean, thinking about it now almost brings me to tears. It was a cool adventure. And it, it's these types of bonding situations and, and things we do as families around fishing um, that, that create those great memories. And, and that's something that will be with me forever. And, you know, it's funny. Um, you know, my son and daughter-in-law just moved back from Ottawa uh, to Vancouver um, uh, last week. And, um, and we were talking about that trip, my son and I, like, you know, 20 plus years after the fact, we were talking about that trip with granddad and that's my favorite fishing memory right there. I had a, um, the chef from the lodge, um, who's Dene, um, from the Northwest Territories and um, she never salmon fished in her life. Um, I brought her out fishing and we got a 58 pound salmon. And to see her take a quick picture after I took some measurements and some scale samples, and to allow her to put it back in the water and release it and watch it swim away powerfully. Um, she was in tears, you know, um, it was amazing. Um, um, it's, a, it's overwhelming the feeling of, of, of just being able to, to conquer something but then let it go, you know, um, to have the fight. And you appreciate what that salmon's done for you, so you let it go, and, and so it can go and do its thing, right? Uh, memories, I think one of the memories that comes back for me is the magic of the dawn, walking down the dock, having 15, 20, 30 fishermen standing there with their rods waiting for us to open, feeling the, the early morning chill in the water coming off of the ocean, the sun reflecting off the mountains. That just was always inspiring for me. Oh. That's good, Josie. Now just move to that side. Keep your tip up nice and high. And now reel, 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 reel. Now you gotta keep that kind of pressure on him. Okay. Right? Just that same amount of pressure. When he pulls really hard, you let go. Like that. Screamer! It's a screamer, all right. It's good. Just keep the pressure. It's going to get, you got a lot more reeling to do yet, ma'am. Oh. He's not quite ready for you to take him in yet, is he? Not quite ready. Keep reeling, fast as you can. Come on. Come on, he's getting slack on you. There you go. See the Good flasher. thing you had that BC Ferries breakfast, ma'am. <laughs> okay, it's a nice fish, I already saw the tail. The tail was the size of some of the other fish we've been getting. <laughs> it's a nice fish. You're not getting away. Yeah, that's good, that's good, that's good. Tip up nice and high. If he turns away. <laughs> nice! You got him, ma'am. Woohoo! Nice fish. See if it's a keeper. Oh. This one, ma'am. Just get the net off from there. And yes, ma'am. Well done. Yeah! You did it. <laughs> How was that? That was awesome. Isn't that incredible? That was awesome. <laughs>
you know, there, it's an indescribable feeling when you're out here on the water and you've, you're spending day, the day with great company. You're learning all about this experience. And, you know, for me, just being out on the water is, is enough of an experience. But, man, when the fish is on and that, those <laughs> reels are screaming and, you know, the adrenaline is pumping, it's unreal. Unforgettable experience. about where the predictions end. Weather, current, tides, wildlife. It just doesn't end and, and every day is totally different. And I think that's what I appreciate about Port Hardy the most is that I just never know. I'm always learning. If the outdoors is your playground. Oh man, look at that. I can't believe we can be standing here. Sportsman's Paradise. <laughs> Welcome to Sportsman Channel. Come on, get your sign. People come from all over to experience this. Let's go, boys. That was unbelievable. This is a magical place. It really is. You're watching a free preview of Sportsman Channel. It's unheard of. I can't believe it, actually. What more could you possibly ask for? Subscribe today by calling your local provider. Hey, we're just getting started. Going into a tough tournament, I think the biggest part of it is it's a mental game. You have no idea what you're getting yourself into. Major League Fishing is back with the Lucas Oil Challenge Cup, presented by BMW Trailer Hitches. Let the Cubs begin. It's always a challenge every time because you don't know what to expect. There he is. Oh, I know how this game is played. Get in here. <laughs> you can never let your foot off the gas. You've got the best guys in the world to compete against. Get in the boat. You just have to take what you know <laughs> and apply it and apply it quick before that score driver starts going off. We just called us a bass. Fly by the seat of your pants. It is what fishing should be. <laughs> and it plays out right in front of your eyes. That's when it starts the morning right there. He's as fired up as I am. I mean, it don't get no cooler than that. The hunt for the cups begins now. General Tire Major League Fishing, Saturday at 3 Eastern on Sportsman. Let's kick this one off. Love is in the air. Let's see what we can make happen. It's an outdoor show like no other. Hopefully this will pass and we can kill a ghost. Pursue the hunt. When we talk about salmon recovery and what do we need to do in order to make that happen, there's sort of three things that, that we consider from, a, from a, a rebuilding population perspective and what they call the three H's. And that is habitat, hatcheries and harvest. And from a harvest perspective, you know, what we're dealing with are these restrictions that we've got in place. So, you know, we went out today and we got three nice Chinook and we were lucky because all three of them were either 80 centimeters or shorter. And that's one example of a restriction that's put in place. And the reason that restriction is there is because 80 centimeters represents the, uh, a size that under 80 centimeters will protect 90% of, uh, of five-year-old Chinook. So that's one example. Another thing that we can consider in terms of uh, rebuilding salmon populations is habitat. And habitat is pretty diverse and complicated when it comes to salmon. When you consider that they spend a big chunk of their life right in the middle of the open ocean, and they spend a big portion of their life as juveniles in rivers. So habitat is a large and far-reaching and complex thing that we need to address in terms of our ability to particularly rebuild those types of salmon that live in the, in the fresh water for, uh, for their, their early part of their life. But the, perhaps one of the simplest and even most controversial things that we, uh, we need to address is the concept of hatcheries or enhancement. So this comes into play um, if we value fisheries we can rebuild salmon populations without getting involved in enhancement. But what we can't do is rebuild salmon populations and maintain fisheries and the important socioeconomic benefits that they provide to communities in the interior of BC and on the coast of BC, plus maintain those important cultural, traditional, social and spiritual connections that people who live in British Columbia have with salmon. Um, I've listened to a lot of people talk about what's happened to the rivers in the stock, everything from overfishing um, to 
the login, past logging practices, um, you know, climate change. My explanation on, on, on how it's come to, to the disaster that it's at is humanity. We've got to learn to take only what we need, um, which is so important. Um, because if we continue to harvest our oceans today at the present standards, there's going to be nothing left for our future generations. The more British Columbians and Canadians get involved in fisheries and fishing and being part of the culture and traditions and economy associated with this incredible resource that we have here, the more stewards for that resource we're going to have out there. You know, it's really important that we focus on the environment in order to have a really sustainable tourism industry and sport fishing industry going forward. The salmon need our help, um, so we got to really work on both ends. When we're not out fishing, we're working in uh, the field, uh, you know, restoring habitat and making things better for all species that are dependent on a healthy environment. You know, we have guests that come to the lodge and, and they bring their children, and I always I always tell those children when I'm, when I'm speaking to them in our introduction that you're our next ambassadors. As a guy who became a grandfather a year ago, I now look to st I think a lot about, so what's my grandson going to have in terms of fishing opportunity? And the way that we can ensure that they are able to enjoy what we enjoy is for us to consider part of the privilege and the, the benefit of going out fishing is your responsibility to make sure that what you do doesn't take things away from future generations. And we can do that, and most of us are doing it. So we just encourage everybody to do it. Most anglers will say that just being on the water is a magic all its own, which is probably why they also say that there is no such thing as a bad day fishing. It is a chance to spend quality time with family and friends and see some of the most extraordinary scenery in the world. But in order to keep this incredible resource available to everyone, a commitment to sustainability through fishing responsibility must be made. Through our efforts now, the salmon will still be here for generations of anglers to come. <laughs>